Hello everybody, Ito Breding. My name is Kalina Sumchinska and I'm a recent graduate from the Master of Arts program in the History of Art Design and Visual Culture at the University of Alberta. My recently completed thesis entitled Creating Resistance by Engaging Destruction, Three Contemporary Feminist Artists from Ukraine, explored how artists have engaged and responded to acts of destruction as a productive force with the capacity to open new possibilities for the interpretation of meaning of art in Ukraine. Today, in honor of March 8th or International Women's Day, I will be giving a presentation entitled From Flowers to Resistance, Art and Protest for March 8th in Contemporary Ukraine. Let us begin. The character of March 8th or International Women's Day has undergone many transformations over the course of Ukraine's history. To help us understand the significance of these changes, let's briefly look at the history of International Women's Day itself. In the late 19th and early 20th century, women in various countries began organizing demonstrations to fight for better working conditions, shorter working hours, and for women's suffrage. Notable marches attracting around 15,000 women occurred in New York in 1908, and the first National Women's Day was recognized by the Socialist Party of America in 1909 on February 28th of that year. The following year, the International Conference for Working Women was held in Copenhagen and Clara Zetkin, representing the Social Democratic Party of Germany, suggested the idea of an International Women's Day to fight for equal rights every year. The outbreak of World War I brought women to the streets in demonstrations for peace suffrage and safe working conditions once again. In 1913 to 1914, large demonstrations were held by Russian women on the date of February 23rd. With international consensus, the date of March 8th, adapted on the Gregorian calendar, was declared International Women's Day. And here begins the deep and tumultuous Ukrainian history. On February 23rd of 1917, March 8th of the Gregorian calendar, women amassed in large numbers in St. Petersburg to argue for bread and peace, an event by some historic analyses that helped spur the February Revolution, which would gain momentum throughout the year toppling the Russian monarchy and ushering in Bolshevik rule. March 8th thus became both a date for women's political activism, but also a communist holiday. As the regime became increasingly totalitarian, the feminist origins of March 8th, March 8th were replaced by propaganda, encouraging women to participate in building the ideal communist society. As Marxist theory had deemed the woman question solved, political leaders saw no reason for women to organize for additional rights. In 1975, International Women's Day was recognized by the UN and its character took on a more apolitical character across the Soviet Union. Men and boys were encouraged to buy women flowers, relinquish them from housework for a day, and celebrate their eternal beauty and femininity. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and declaration of independence in Ukraine, the commemoration of March 8th did not change much. The practice of greeting women with flowers and celebrating the day akin to how we celebrate Mother's Day continued. At the same time, women in gender studies programs did begin emerging in Ukrainian universities and scholars and literary figures such as Solomia Pavlichko and Oksana Zabushko were analyzing the challenges of independence and its effect on women and women's rights. But all of these activities were rather marginal. Any utterance of feminism was greeted with severe hostility and many believed it had no application in Ukrainian society. They were skeptical of any theories and analyses that critiqued Ukrainian society and believed that this threatened the cohesion required for nation building. These were areas that both Solomia Pavlichko and Oksana Zabushka were highly critical of. But women soon grew tired with the inequality that they encountered in Ukrainian society, the double standards and prescribed and diminutive gender roles. And this came to a head in 2008. That year, former President Viktor, Viktor Yushchenko issued his annual address for March 8th, and it read as follows. Dear Ukrainian women, greetings on the occasion of the holiday of spring, the holiday of women's beauty which blossomed in Ukraine today. My heart is filled with the most tender feelings for you. You charm the hearts of millions of Ukrainian men. We are faithful and grateful for your love. I wish you happiness, love, and a real indispensable confidence that in our lives, in our relationships, in our families, everything will be all right. Everything we are doing, we are doing for you. And this day, as well as Mother's Day in May, are probably our best day to dedicate to you. 
We love you, we respect you, and we thank you. Our mothers, our wives, our beloved girlfriends, our daughters, all the most important women in our life. It is spring in Ukraine now. Happy spring. May you have strong health and may your wishes and dreams come true. May you have inspiration, good humor, and great wisdom that protects us all. May greetings on the occasion of the holiday of love and hope to the Ukrainian women, the most charming and the best in the world. But women didn't take so happily and kindly to this address. They had had enough. And in response to this address, several scholars and professionals penned an open letter that read as follows. Do we really deserve gratitude exclusively for our family input? What about our creativity, knowledge, professionalism, experience, talent, leadership? We believe that the president of Ukraine has to value us, full-fledged Ukrainian citizens, especially for these features. We are not the quote, weaker sex, and we do not want to be considered as an embellishment of male society. It's quote, beautiful half. We demand to be perceived as equal and competent citizens of a democratic country. We want you to value us for our human, not essentially female merits, for our expertise and talents, for our creative and intellectual potential, for our professional achievements, for our civic standards, but not for our family statuses. Do not reduce our contribution to the nation state building to family and household duties only. We are capable of more than just performing orders. We can take over responsibilities, make serious decisions, and manage enterprises, institutions, and the state. We do so every day. We expect you, our president, to guarantee our equal rights and ensure real opportunities for their implementation. And with this open address, the character of March 8th began to change quite drastically in Ukraine. Following the public outcry and indignation towards former President Yushchenko's March 8th address, women across Ukraine began to recraft March 8th through various creative demonstrations that drew attention to issues of discrimination, health and power imbalances, while celebrating the accomplishments of historic and contemporary Ukrainian women. They aimed to make these demonstrations political once again. In 2008, the first march that occurred under this new wave amassed about 30 to 40 individuals and was organized by various women's organizations and attended by members of the LGBTQIA community and also men who were allied in the fight for gender equality and human rights. At this demonstration on the streets of Kyiv, you could see signs and posters that read slogans such as which is a flower, the rest of the week neuroses, or Don't give flowers for the 8th of March. This is a day of social struggle. It's important to note that this demonstration and many of the ones that followed, including up until the present moment, were often attended by counter demonstrators who were of a conservative, highly nationalistic and far right vein. They would often aim to intimidate those who were participating in the marches by throwing paint at them and eggs, especially after they would disperse following the events. In 2011, the marches began to have a distinctly feminist quality when they were organized by the group Feministichna Offensiva. This is a very important group in the history of feminism in Ukraine and were quite influential. They aimed to take feminism outside the academy and bring it to the streets, highlighting issues that everyday women could relate to and hosting events and workshops open to the public. They strove to make feminism relevant, applicable, and non-threatening, although this is not to be mistaken for not critical. This kicked off a new tradition where the March 8th demonstrations were critical and political, political and collectively fought in various aspects for change in Ukrainian social and political life. Several of the slogans that the marches rallied around in the following years emphasize some of the values of the marches. For example, in 2012, the central slogan was Cerkva i Drzava, Čas Žetinarizno, Time for the Church and State to Live Apart. And the following year, it was Dosic prekrivate nerivni s tradicijame, Enough covering up inequality with tradition. And this one in particular, sought to draw attention to the to two bills that were proposed that would have limited abortion and criminalized homosexual propaganda, as it was so called, in the bill within Ukraine. Um, it is important to note that these bills were not passed, and this also coincided with the time where the revolution of dignity or the Yevromaidan began in Ukraine. 
And at this point, feminism began to take a slightly different character in Ukraine. Many argue that the Yevromaidan created an environment where individuals began to realize the power of mass protest and active political organization. On the Yevromaidan, many women's and LGBTQIA groups did take to the streets to argue for equal participation in the protests, challenge traditional gender roles that were reinforced by many male protesters, and also to bring attention to their own diverse interests. In the March 8th demonstrations that followed, increasing numbers of women began to participate who represented diverse groups within Ukrainian society. Some of these groups included sex workers, Roma, and veterans returning from the war in the Donbass. They could see feminism as a critical lens and ally to, al to analyze their subjective experiences and to fight for dignity, human rights, and social supports within Ukrainian society. It is also at this moment that we saw an increase in feminist organizations, exhibitions, and initiatives of all across Ukraine. I'm just briefly going to talk about two of these examples. In the center here, we have a t-shirt that says, it's not my obligation to smile. It was created by the feminist organization Feministichna Maestadnia that operates out of Lviv and was formed in 2014. Feministichna Maestadnia is a nonprofit that works to engage youth in feminist consciousness raising while also providing a safe space for learning, inquiry, and discussion. They even function as an emergency shelter for individuals facing homelessness. They host various workshops, events, and protests that address diverse topics such as menstruation and body positivity, racial inequality, and fight for basic safety and infrastructure within the city of Lviv. The organization is extremely inclusive and introduces diverse and cr critical feminist issues in an approachable and inviting manner. The other two images that I have on the screen here are exhibition catalogs from two feminist exhibitions that were organized by the curator, artist, and writer Oksana Bruchovetska, who was a long time director of the Visual Culture Research Center in Kyiv, an exhibition venue and arts organization that was incredibly welcoming to feminism and the LGBTQIA community and who hosted socially engaged events throughout the 2010s. The two exhibitions that I have here were Matarinstvo and Textus, which both explored various themes such as the construction of femininity and masculinity, subjective experiences of motherhood or the decision not to have children, and also engage the sub subversive potential of textile practices, domesticity, and gendered labor. These exhibitions often featured artists from countries such as Poland and the Czech Republic, emphasizing the, emphasizing the importance of building solidarity across borders. At this point in the presentation, I want to turn our attention to two banners created by the artist Dana Kavalina for the March 8th demonstrations first in 2018 and then in 2019. These banners are significant because they bring attention to various obstacles that women continue to face in Ukrainian society and the backstories behind the banners themselves truly emphasize these struggles. First, a little bit of information about the 2018 demonstration. So that year, the central slogan for the marches was or we will no longer tolerate. And the demonstrators sought to bring attention to domestic violence by highlighting the fact that in 2017, there were more fatalities from domestic violence than fatalities in the ongoing war. The banner that you see here was made in collaboration between Dana Cavallina and a larger group of women and it features a distressed naked woman as in the center of a black background. From the margins of the banner, hands holding various objects pull and prod the woman, a coat hanger, a cross, an egg, a piece of rope, and the Ukrainian trident or trezub. These various emblems assaulting the woman represent social and political institutions that have continued to negatively impact the freedom and well-being of women in Ukrainian society. In the context of an International Women's Day March, this image explicitly illustrated what the art demonstrators were arguing for and against. For a woman's right to exist free of oppression and against institutionalized forms of sexism and discrimination. In an interview with Oksana Bruchovetska, 
Cavallina discusses how the symbols on the banner represent the most pressing obstacles women in contemporary Ukraine face. For example, the coat hanger pointed towards the woman's vagina refers to the Verkhovna Rada's continual reopening of the abortion debate, proposing that women should only terminate pregnancies for medical reasons or in the instance of rape, something that we discussed earlier in the presentation and that was a central slogan of the demonstration in 2013. The cross poking the woman in the head refers to the strong influence of the Orthodox and Catholic churches, especially in promoting the traditional family and corresponding gender roles. However, the most controversial symbol was the use of the trezup, largely considered a state emblem, but that has also been appropriated by far-right paramilitary organizations such as Nazionalni Druzhene. Cavallino argues that the trezup in this instance was intended to suggest the prevalence of far-right violence in Ukrainian society, but it drew a violent response from this very political faction, exemplifying her point. As the demonstrators made their way through the streets displaying the torture and humiliation of their illustrated sister, they encountered fierce opposition from far-right counter-protesters. The women participating in the march were attacked by these, by these protesters who tried to rip the banner from their hands and forcing the police to intervene. The police requested that the demonstrators refrain from showing the banner for it was deemed offensive. Ultimately, the banner was destroyed in the confrontation between the protesters, the far right and police. The relationship between the naked woman and the trezub poking at her drew the strong response from the far right, but also from a vaster audience who interpreted the imagery as criticism of the state. It is safe to say that Cavallino was criticizing the state. However, the terms for their criticism are different. Those criticizing the banner remarked that it was inappropriate to criticize the state during a military conflict, and this controversy resulted in a lawsuit against the organizer of the march, Olena Shevchenko, for desecrating a national symbol. It's important to note that the charges were subsequently dropped. The vehement reaction towards the banner and its ultimate destruction increased its significance both for the far right and feminist groups alike. The far right believed the banner exemplified their perspective that, quote, feminism is an ideology that, that supports the demise of the nation, end quote. While feminists and activists interpreted the destruction of the banner as an example of the power of images and the socio-political obstacles that must be overcome in Ukrainian society. Now back to the critique of nationalism. The controversy surrounding the banner engages the relationship between feminism, nationalism, and militarism in a country engaged in military conflict. The destruction of the banner raises the question, how can feminism engage in this dialogue and respond to the destructive force of far-right ideology? In 2019, Dana Kavalina would paint another banner for the March 8th demonstrations that took place in Kyiv. This banner directly responded to the destruction and criticism of the 2018 banner. What it does is illustrate a dystopia that she hypothesizes is possible if the ideologies of extreme militarism and far-right nationalism and the actions of their adherents do not go unchecked in Ukrainian society. A question as to what extent feminism can reconcile with nationalism and militarism in the context of Ukraine, or whether women's and LGBTQIA plus rights will always fall subordinate to the totalizing ideologies of the latter. In this banner, we see that the body has undergone a transformation from a robust and youthful yet battered body that we saw in the 2018 banner to a gaunt, deprived and depleted female body. The woman lays across the foreground of the black banner with bald head arched backwards and expression of pain stretched across her face and empty black eyes pointed up towards an indiscernible ether. She lays with her legs spread apart, giving birth to several infants actively crawling out of her open vagina with faces resembling grown men rather than newborn babies. In contrast to the aching red tones depicting her body, these babies have been depicted in a ghostly gray. Extending from her throbbing and inflamed body, four arms reach towards these adult infants who are metamorphosizing into grown men, soldiers, as soon as they enter the world. One even points a rifle towards the woman's open vagina. The two arms extending directly from her body hold a pot of borscht and a spoon, feeding the open mouths of these parasitic infants. In her other arm, she holds a rifle, 
pointed towards her newborn children while picking up one of these infants turned soldiers with the other. In the space between her spread knees, these men have grown into fully featured men, evolving into soldiers as they ascend along the right edge of the picture plane. Above her agonized face, the soldiers have been depicted in sequence, with the first extending his arm towards the woman's face. With one face overlapping the next, they suggest a lineage of men to come. The woman has only birthed male infants, gendering the image in terms of the roles men and women occupy within this dystopia. Women feed and reproduce while men defend. Or do they? Cavallina's 2019 banner challenges this assumption by painting the soldiers aiming at the vagina of the woman who birthed them with their rifles. They are no longer defending the national mother embodied by the woman on the image, but threatening her with sexual violence and defilement. Birthing these soldiers, the woman becomes subordinate and disposable to the nation, as the soldiers reinforce their position as patriarchal authorities. Recognizing her position of oppression, she attempts infanticide as she points her own rifle towards these adult infants continuing to crawl out of her vagina. The banner functions as a feminist critique of certain expectations and gendered tropes of femininity that become common in societies engaged in military conflict. The banner takes these expectations to an extreme to demonstrate how they are unsustainable if they continue on this path. Now let us take a look at some of these representations. The woman's position in labor and continually feeding her infants, ironically with a pot of borscht that we can assume she just cooked, speaks to the idea that when the nation is under threat, women should birth and raise strong citizens and support their male counterparts who are fighting out on the front. Her position holding a rifle militarizes the image. It recalls images of armed women, such as the statue of the motherland that sit over the Dnipro that symbolize a strong maternal figure defending the land from invasion, the so-called mother of the nation. But this woman in the image is defending herself not from foreigners, but from her own children. And this is the final piece of the poster. The woman's bald head and the fact that these soldiers that she has just birthed are aiming a gun towards her vagina refer to forms of sexual humiliation that women often face in times of war, both historically and presently. Since the war began, women in Ukraine have faced increased rates of domestic violence as men return from the front with trauma and PTSD that they take out on their wives. Women living in or near the occupied territories have reported accounts of rape by soldiers from both sides of the conflict. And additionally, female soldiers often encounter sexual assault and harassment within the military itself. Many of these accounts go unreported or are underreported and these issues are not publicly addressed. What Kavanina's poster does is bring these issues into the public space and challenges Ukrainian society to address them and empowers those around her to change them. Her poster critiques nationalism, although it is not anti-Ukrainian. It is a desperate call for peace and a feminist call to address women's issues or else we will face dire circumstances. So what has occurred in Ukraine since Dana Kavalina paraded that banner through the streets of Kyiv accompanied by many other women in 2019? In 2020, several organizations continued to host events for March 8th or marches in solidarity with women's protests that had been occurring in neighboring countries. For example, demonstrations took place in several Ukrainian cities in solidarity with Polish women fighting against the tight restrictions on abortion that were legislated earlier this year. This year, Feministyczna Majsternia will host its annual event, Feministyczna Vesna, a cheeky reference to Yushchenko's address that we had explored earlier this year, a week-long event of workshops, exhibitions, and lectures. Additionally, conversations have been occurring about race and intersectionality within Ukrainian society in the wake of Black Lives Matter protests that have been occurring globally. While there isn't a Black Lives Matter movement per se in Ukraine itself, the conversation around race has been initiated by feminists and carried on by, by individuals such as Oksana Bruchovetska and events hosted by Feministechna Maisternia. So in summary, Ukrainian women have worked hard to reshape March 8th as a political and feminist occasion. With creativity and resilience, they have found avenues to advocate for themselves and those facing oppression in Ukrainian society. They have brought issues existing on the margins into the streets of Ukraine's major cities, 
in bold, provocative, and unapologetic ways. If you have enjoyed my presentation today, you may also be interested in a panel discussion organized to recognize March 8th this year. The discussion has been organized by the Ukrainian Institute London and includes a panel composed of Dr. Tamara Marcinyuk, Dr. Emily Chanel Justice, and Dr. Jessica Zachovic. It is entitled 30 Years of Women's Activism in Ukraine. The research of all three of these excellent scholars has greatly shaped my own thesis and research. Here you will find a select bibliography for my presentation today. In no way is this complete, but it includes several resources that explore the history and recognition of March 8th in contemporary Ukraine. If you have any further questions or would like to be directed towards other readings, please feel free to send me an email. My email will be on the following slide. Thank you for tuning into my presentation today and in solidarity for International Women's Day. Yakuyu. Okay, my name is Dr. Stella Hrinyuk. Um, I'm a retired professor of Ukrainian history and Ukrainian Canadian history uh, from the University of Manitoba. And here I, I've lived in Winnipeg most of my life and I've been part of Osiradok, the sponsor of this presentation for, uh, for many, many years. And I'm, I'm really proud of, of these uh, presentations that are, that are being organized. I'm volunteering currently and I have the pleasure of sharing this presentation with Ms. Kalina Somchinsky on feminism in Ukraine, especially its manifestation on art and culture in Ukraine. So Kalena, I congratulate you on this really important work. I see you've worked very hard and thought a lot about it. And I congratulate you on getting your master's degree in Ukrainian history. That's welcome to the club of Ukrainian women, academics, small but growing, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah uh, I'm a strong believer in Women's Day. And um, as I told you before, I've always celebrated it. And I think that what you've done is uh, given us a glimpse into what some brave and very bold women are doing in the past few years. Um, so I, I have some questions for you and some comments. Um, certainly the women's movement has changed in character. So my first question for you is uh, why did you choose this topic for your master's thesis? So I began thinking about women's rights in Ukraine, actually when I took a history course in my undergraduate degree. And this course was on contemporary conflicts and we explored Ukraine. And we looked at the Revolution of Dignity or Yevdo Maidan, and we looked at the conflict. And for my final paper for that course, I decided to explore how women participated on the Maidan. And what I realized was, there, it was that there was this wealth of literature, and it was really interesting. And just by starting, you know, one term paper that was quite simple. Um, when I began my master's, I thought, what else is happening in terms of feminism in Ukraine? Because this is something I had had no previous knowledge of mm -hmm. and was never mentioned in any of the courses I took um, growing up or in Ukrainian yeah. school, even in university at that. So I began Just typical, right? This is typical. not unusual uh, to hear you saying that there's not much about women's movements, women's history in our in our university or any other courses. So yeah. you you really struck out on your own. And especially in the in the Ukrainian courses, it was very very small. Um, yeah. So where my research began looking at art was honestly through a little bit of a Google search. Um, I hadn't even started my master's yet and I stumbled upon this excellent um, open access journal that was online called Feministichna Kritika. And it was edited by two individuals, Maria Mayovchuk and Olya Plahotnik, who were both part of Feministichna Offensiva. So one of the really great feminist organizations that started in CAVE in the 2010s. And from there, they started publishing exhibition reviews of these exhibits that were taking place. Yes. And that kind of launched me into thinking about the feminist art in Ukraine. 
Okay, so just a little uh, digression from that. Uh, what do, I'm sure you've studied more about the Ukrainian women in, uh, or the women in Ukraine now. Uh, can you give us kind of a snapshot of the life of a, say, a professional woman in Ukraine? You've spent some time there, right? Yes, yes. yes. Let's, let's look at what we're talking about here. So um, the, I'm going to start by saying that the experiences of women in Ukraine are very diverse. And even when we're talking about um, feminism, I actually like to think about feminism in plural in Ukraine because there's so many different branches and so many different ways that women can find to identify with it. Um, and the women who I met in Ukraine actually came from a variety of demographics. So there were quite some young women who were um, just starting to like get a professional footing. Work. There was one who I met, she was working as a curator at a, a modern sculpture museum. But even in saying that, I'm having a hard time um, breaking it down to the ordinary life of one woman because, so for example, this artist who I met, she was working as a curator. She was um, in her late 20s, but she had a seven-year-old son. She was a single mom. So she's, you know, maintaining an artistic practice while also taking care of her son and um, having to provide a stable income for them. Well, at the same time, I've also met other artists who have had a more established career. They yes. work in various um, arts institutions for longer periods of time. They're already, you know, in their late 30s, early 40s. Um, uh -huh. Have that ability to travel and research in a different capacity. Um, but generally speaking, in Ukraine, it is, there is still quite a gender wage gap. And it's quite significant. It's on on average, 23%, um, but up to 35% in professions such as postal couriers, in finance, and actually in arts and recreation. <laughs> so a woman, I know I mostly knew people who were in academics, and they were they were poorly paid. All, all academics were poorly paid, but women seemed to get a, a, a bad deal as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, as you say, there are two feminisms? Are you are you thinking kind of by class, like the working poor, if you like, and the women who have been able to make their way up the ladder to more uh, exalted positions? I would say there's a variety, even more than two feminisms, um, because it's really how women define it for themselves. But it's very different. I actually find... Let's put it this way. Feminism is still quite marginal in Ukraine. Yeah. So a lot of, um, you would say maybe like your, your average citizen might not even be involved in this thinking about, you know, of course they know that their life is different as a woman and they face certain challenges, but they might not be analyzing their life in the scope of feminism. Um, it's, it's several different generations who are involved in it because you did have these scholars like Oksana Zabushko, yeah, who, you know, and Solomia Pavlichko, who is past, but... I know her too. I knew her, actually. Yeah. I had met her many years ago. And I have Zabushko's book. Um, I've forgotten the name of it now. Something about sex. The work of the Ukrainian sex? Yes. Uh, uh, my friend Helena Hrein translated that book, so uh, it's it's a, a great, very interesting book. Um, so let me just say to ask you about us uh, about movement, the uh, protest movements, like the marches and the and the and the banner. Um, uh, you name a few of the groups, and I think you've also uh, looked at other collectives. But uh, how do their activities, you think, compare? to similar groups outside Ukraine in terms of, of the of women's issues and social issues. I'm thinking of Pussy Riot in Russia. I think you've probably looked at their stuff. Yeah. Um, do, how do you think the Ukrainian women's movements in, uh, in Kiev and Ukraine and in Lviv and Kiev, how are they doing, do you think? I think they're doing well. Um, Feministichna Maesternia in Yovil is amazing. It's a wonderful organization. They, I follow them on social media to keep track of what they're doing. And I really find 
And the, the why I think they're so successful is because they reach out to youth and they get youth involved in a way that's very accessible. Students? Students and teenagers. Oh, so really? Good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Before COVID, they would hold like summer camps. Okay. That's, like, that's certainly a difference yeah. from when I was there in the 90s. And do you yeah. think they're having an influence on the older generation as well? Or are they, are they kind of focusing on the youth? They're focusing on the youth, but their marches do attract people from all generations. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's their major means of, of protest marches on certain days. Yeah. So there's um, the International Women's Day marches. There's Take Back the Night, which happens in November as well. Um, and then they'll also have demonstrations, sometimes smaller scale demonstrations for different events. So, for example, um, they were doing a lot of activity about making, it was in relation to Take Back the Night, but making the streets of Nubia safer in terms of basic infrastructure, such as good lighting. Right. Um, also making sure that you have accessible and affordable bathrooms for people. That's excellent. That's very great work. So how do you see the role of the graphic artist in these movements? Um, so Dana Cavallina, who designed those posters, is actually trained as a graphic artist and works um, in that capacity. So she has done various professional work as well. She did a, uh, a poster series that was in um, collaboration with, I think it was the, um, see, I can't remember the exact acronym now, but it was with CEDAW. So it was a UN sponsored gender discrimination campaign right. and gender discrimination. Well, those are her banners that you show in this, in this presentation. They're pretty bold. Very bold, yeah. They're, they're pretty graphic. That, I mean, that's what they're supposed to be. But I, um, I wondered how representative she was of the artists who are in the movement. Is it, are, the, are the artists who are depicting whatever their version of feminist or feminine oppression is, are they working in that same sort of, uh, it's actually a very dark medium? Um, some yes and some no. So it's quite, it's very diverse. Um, I would say that there are a number of, a number of women who decide to tackle these really difficult topics. Um, there's another one, Maria Kulikowska, who works with representations of her body and casts of her body. And um, her, a lot of her subject matter and her pieces, she actually destroys these casts um, herself. Mm. And she has an interesting story because she's from Crimea and she's been displaced and unable to return home since it was annexed by Russia. Oh dear. Her family does live there. So she really works with this idea of the, con the contemporary conflict and how it plays in on ordinary right. people. But there are a lot of other artists who will work with textile, for example, yeah. and explore... Um, women's labor and the, the domestic um, domestic labor versus kind of a more public labor. Um, there's also artists um, who have worked on the topic of migrant labor and done yeah. portraits of women working um, as domestics and in agriculture and um, in serving roles in Poland. And they're actually, actually exhibited in Poland. So there's a lot of work that um, maybe visually isn't as provocative, but the subject matter is just right. as yeah. important. So why do you think that the reaction against these, these depictions is so virulent, so violent? I think um, part of it is because what you have in Ukraine is this far right movement, which we're starting to recognize in North America as well. And you've had it in Ukraine for quite a long time and they're very conservative, um, very right wing neo-Nazi groups. And, but they are often yeah. formed, of, they're often formed of kind of like disenchanted young men um, who don't see a purpose in society. So it's almost like kind of similar to gangs. Kind of um, anarchists, is that what you'd say of them? 
Not quite, because there's actually some anarchist organizations in Ukraine that are very pro-human rights and anti-discrimination. So it's complicated in that way, but they're, um, I'd say the closest would be far right, almost neo-Nazi. And, and what are they reacting against mostly in these, in the protests? In the protests, it's um, often they're very, very homophobic. Um, so a lot of the women's right. marches pride marches do uphold LGBTQIA plus rights. Um, there's this strong movement against gender in Ukraine that actually um, the church was part of as well. And it was this idea that um, somehow gender is dangerous because it's going to, well, quite frankly, um, you know, take women out of their traditional roles. But which is, which is um, I think I was going to say, I think we've we see some of that in other countries. It's not just Ukraine. So I, but it is interesting that the the right the right wing is reacting. How does the how does the the left or the center of the political spectrum react to these protests? Are they supportive? Are they are they supportive of the women's movement? The left is very supportive. Um, and then as for the middle, I'm not quite sure because I think in some respects, the um, it's one of those things that those who are involved, uh, those who are involved are usually part of the left in Ukraine. Um, but they're also, despite their the visibility of these marches, I'd say the movements in general, in many respects are still quite marginal. I guess I, I always wonder whether the Ukrainian diaspora in other countries, even Canada, is aware of um, of this this sort of pain and suffering that mm -hmm. Ukrainian women still have to undergo. And is is there anything you can see that can be can be done to help Ukrainian women um, in their in their struggle, really, in Ukraine? Uh, in Ukraine, yeah. yeah. Um, I think part of it, something that I, I can't speak too much of it on this because it's not part of my research, right. but Jessica Zahovich, who really helped me with my thesis, um, she was one of the readers who edited my thesis for me. Um, and actually, I advertised a lecture that she's going to be taking part in the panel discussion um, within my presentation. But one thing that she has mentioned is working with various institutions, if you have that capacity, um, to tackle these issues of gender discrimination in Ukraine. That's very, it's really important. I think the sort of solidarity you mentioned in your presentation, the solidarity with European women and with women anywhere. But uh, I can only speak from my own experience, but for Canada, I think Ukrainian women um, have had the um, the opportunities, many opportunities that the Ukrainian women would not have, and yet there have been critics of Ukrainian women's organizations in Canada. People have said that uh, Ukrainian women's organizations were too dependent on on the on the men's organizations, and I don't see it quite that way. I think there's been an interdependence uh, between them. Say something like UNF, which is behind this, uh, behind Osirado. Um, but I think that, that there is something to be learned um, by the experience of Ukrainian Canadian women mm -hmm. in Ukraine, if, if there were ever some way to do that. And I suppose, are you doing gender studies now so that you can be of some kind of, um, can you be a professional that can help in your writing with, uh, with the Ukrainian women's movement? Well, that's something that I'm really working on now, and I'm so grateful that I'm able to disseminate my research through this lecture that we're, we're doing here. And I also did a lecture series um, with Aqua, Alberta Council for Ukrainian Arts in Edmonton, um, so that my research is out there. And for a public audience, um, I really do, I'm working on publishing my work, but it's hard because when you publish an academic settings, the yeah. academic, which is important, but you need to reach a larger audience than just. Yeah. I, I know of what you speak. This, besides marches, what do you think they could, uh, the women's movement, the women who are passionate about this and the men um, 
who are helping them, I'm sure. What mm -hmm. else could they be doing to, to move the, the needle a little? And I think what, um, what I've been seeing that people are doing is really looking at feminism within the larger umbrella of human rights. And so coming out to work for issues um, such as, like I was mentioning, you know, safe infrastructure in the cities, but also, you know, a lot of this feminist work where um, that was starting in the 2010s was tackling issues such as, you know, access to um, proper heated buildings and hot water. And so that's one yeah. way of making feminism applicable and palatable to a larger audience is by saying it's about caring for one another and making our society better for everybody. That's typically been the, the kind of goal of the women's movement everywhere. I mean, suffrage was for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, women's rights, uh, I think always have been human rights. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you're working on this and I want to wish you a happy Women's Day and I wish our audience a happy Women's Day too. Thank you for watching this presentation. I, I know we'll, have, we'll hear more of Ms. Sumchinsky. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me today.